So just as we start, uh, we'd like to acknowledge country. So I'm inviting everyone here just to close your eyes, sit quietly in your space. I want you to think about your travels here this morning to the conference. Where did you leave your room? Did you travel by foot? Did you walk on country? Perhaps you walked past trees, felt the grass underneath your feet or the crunch of bark or leaves. Perhaps you walked past or over a waterway and saw the leaves floating along the top of the surface. Perhaps, like me, you caught a scooter and you felt the wind brush against your face. We're on Ngunnawal and Ngambri country. We honour and pay respect to Ngunnawal elders, Ngambri elders, their old people and their young people coming through that will all be privileged to walk alongside. Ngunnawal elders and community members and Ngambri elders and community members have lived on this country, loved and cared for their children. It's been a place of learning, a place of adventure, a place of understanding and an opportunity to learn to live and love on country. We honour those elders, all of our First Nations and First Peoples that have travelled here today and over the last few days to join in this celebration and this opportunity of doing better. We also honour and pay respects to our non-Indigenous brothers and sisters who are walking alongside us, who we ask to help us carry the burden. Take your space and place, but to be mindful not to take our space and place. Think about the country that you'll be travelling on at the end of today and homeward bound. I ask you to walk gently and take care. Gobata. <laughs> so just introducing myself, my name's Nicole Mercer. I'm a Wadarong woman with ties to Wurundjeri. I am new to Deakin and School of Medicine. Um, working there as the Associate Head of School Indigenous Strategy and working with the amazing Indigenous Health Team as well. So what I'd like to do is I want you to get to know these amazing individuals. So I'll just ask each of you just to introduce yourself and perhaps share with us something that you found really exciting, maybe from studying medicine, maybe from the conference, yeah, thank you everyone. Um, just like to do a quick acknowledgement as well to Ngambri and Ngunnawal elders. Um, yeah, I just want to say, first of all, um, my name is Jella Thomas. I'm a Yangamata Bidjigali man, a Nyamu man from the Pilbara. Um, my community is near Marble Bar, um, and Marble Bar is known as being the hottest town in WA, but I think it's a bit hotter in our community. Um, but yeah, I've just wanted to thank everyone who's been a part of this conference and giving the students and I'm sure on behalf of all the students we'd just like to thank every single one of you for letting us come along this journey being able to share our stories um, and to be able to share um, where we come from and also learn from such experience and expertise people um, like yourselves in the room um, for me this conference I've I've been to a few um, over the past years and I've really come to enjoy the intercultural um, 
exchange of knowledge systems with our Maori brothers and sisters. Um, you know, in many ways, I think there's a lot to learn uh, from your experiences and just the positive influences and stories that we ha have heard this week and continue to hear. Um, so yeah, that's probably my number one thing. I might mm. pass it on to Kyle. Yawa yawa nara bejara yagara yukurupo yawa yawa nara bejara ngana wongembri marumba bayang marumba barara marumba barara. My name's Carl. I'm a yagara yukurupo man from Manala, Queensland. Um, I acknowledge the traditional customs of land here, the Ngana Wongambri people, and I hope we all rise up strong together forward. Um, I'm from the University of Queensland. I'm in year three in the MD program there. Um, and I've got a few roles, so just please bear with me. I, I hate this part. Um, but um, I'm the Australian Indigenous Doctors Association student director. Um, I, I lead the student representative council from all the universities that elect a student from each university. They are elected on the SRC and I get the wonderful privilege to um, lead them and listen and advocate for them. I'm also on the Australian Medical Student Association's Indigenous Co-Chair, where I try and help make that organisation a more culturally safe space for our Indigenous students and also help um, bring our non-Indigenous brothers and sisters along with that journey. Um, I'm also involved with my University of Queensland's Medical Society um, as the Indigenous Co-Chair and just help and support the younger mob that are rising up through that role at the moment. And lastly, my most proud um, position is I'm still, um, I'm the executive board director of Inala Wangara, which is an Aboriginal community controlled organisation. And we get to do a lot of work around health, justice and education and, and, and increase the wellbeing of our mob in, in our community. The, the biggest thing that I find interesting, just to answer your question, Nicole, is I think that it amazes me every time I come here to conferences like these, Pridoc or even AIDA conference, and I walk away feeling so much more filled up than what I feel like when I, when I by myself up in the community. I just feel like there's power and strength and there's power in numbers and I just feel so privileged to be able to be in this space. Thank you. Wow, how do I go after that? Tēnā tātou katoa, e mihi ana ahau ki ngā mana whenua o tēnei rohi, ngā hapu o Brambury rawako uh, Nanawu ngā mihi hoki ki ngā rangatira e mua e nainei uh, e muri e mihi ngā mihi kia koutou katoa he sorry I'm a bit nervous um, ko waio uh, he uri Tēnei no Ngāti Kahununu ki wairo rongo whakāta uh, kaitahu uh, Ngāti Parau uh, me mōri ori uh, ko Zoe Kora Tōku Ingoa. Uh, so my name's Zoe. I, I'm from Aotearoa, New Zealand. I hail from the east coast of the North Island mainly, but some of the South Island as well, including the Chatham Islands, which are the Moriori people. Uh, I'm a final year medical student at the University of Otago, based at the Dunedin campus. Uh, I've got a long journey into medical school. Um, my whanau were uh, working class, so both of my parents were labourers. My mum was a rousey and my dad was a sharer. Um, so there wasn't a huge emphasis on education. Um, I ended up leaving school at the age of 15 and going to work and just hanging out in the shearing sheds. Um, it wasn't until I was about, I, I, I worked in the shearing sheds, did a bit of hospo, um, kind of urbanised like most Māori. Um, and then I was involved in the Christchurch earthquake. Uh, so, again, displaced from where I was living, which was Christchurch. Uh, ended up doing a nursing degree. Uh, so I've got nine years experience as a registered nurse. Uh, I went back home and started working in my own community. And it's a community where 50% of the population are Māori. Um, and I was coming into interactions with Māori and their whanau and going, why? Why is this happening? You'd have 50-year-olds with cancer. You'd have kids coming in and out of the hospital really, really unwell. Um, and I felt I just, there was lots of dis discomfort and a lot of questions going on in my head going, why is this happening? Um, so I, I kept nursing and um, looking at the doctors going, why can't I be that? Can I be that? And then I was like, maybe I can be that. So I actually uh, 
applied to the University of Otago in secret. <laughs> Um, I didn't tell anyone. I, I got into university and um, I started the dreaded health science. Um, was quite unsuccessful there. Uh, didn't have the basics of science. So chemistry, physics, those just weren't in my forte. They weren't in the sharing sheds, that's for sure. Um, so that was a big learning experience for me. Uh, Anyway, I got through that. I did a Bachelor of Science, uh, major in anatomy and a minor in Māori, um, and I eventually got into the medical program. Um, so I bring all that history with me as I navigate the space of med school. Um, for me, some of the most touching and memorable moments during med school or exciting moments as well, uh, still dealing with whānau um, and interacting with Māori families, making sure that their experience in healthcare is positive and also just a lot of collaborative work with uh, a lot of my peers who are also here um, and the new mob that I've made. <laughs> um, so that's a little bit about me and how I've gotten here and what really fuels me as well. It's really Good beautiful. Up. Thank you, Zoe. Um, kia tato. Um, te tuatahi, um, he katika ki, um, te mana whenua o tēnei wahi, tēnei rohi, ko te iwi, um, Nambri, ko te iwi, nanua hoki, um, wai hoki, um, me mahi ki nga kai whakahaere o tēnei kaupapa tino whakahirira, um, um, and me mahi ki a koutou katoa ko tai mai, uh, ki konei, hui ai, uh, whakapuninga ai, um, ai. Um, ko tisa shepa tōku ingoa, he uri tēnei nō Ngāpuhi me Ngātuhine. Um, he tauira whakatauhau te tau tō ono ki te whare wānanga o Tām ki Makaura. Um, so kia ora everyone, um, my name is Tessa Shepherd. I am from two iwi in Aotearoa, New Zealand called Ngāpuhi and Ngātuhine. Um, I hail from a little town in the Northland region of New Zealand um, called Totoro. That's the little centre of the universe, as we like to call it. <laughs> um, I have huge interests in public health and rural health, um, and I'm just really excited to be here amongst some role models and some leaders in Indigenous health. Um, yeah, I'm really grateful to be here. Um, and I'm excited to hear what everyone else has to say today. So, kia ora. Chingibala, <laughs> uh, everybody. Chingibala, my name is Thomas. Um, I'm a third year medical student at Sydney University. Um, I would also like to pay respects to the Nambri and Animal people and thank them for welcoming me on their country. <sighs> what a week it's been so far, hey? <laughs> it's been so good to meet some new people from across the ditch, across the country, and also see some old faces from past life. Um, I'm very humbled to be here, especially be on this panel. I feel, you know, almost like a little bit, but <laughs> that's all right. Um, yeah, so I'm based out of Sydney University, but this year I'm studying up on Bunjilung country, so in Lismore. Um, that's the lands of my ancestral people, so I'm a proud Bunjilung man. Um, it's great being back on country. I think that's probably what I love most about the program is being able to do something like that. Um, get to reconnect with uh, my country, extended family. Um, yeah, I think my journey to med school has been an interesting one. I think I never wanted to go into medical school right until the last minute. Um, I was dead set on being an English teacher for years. Um, I did one sort of placement in year 12. My year advisor let me take his class and I got out of that really quickly. <laughs> um, but I always loved education and I always wanted to be a teacher in some capacity. Um, and, you know, throughout med school, you see people that are a few years ahead of you or, or years ahead of you and how passionate they are about teaching and educating the future generations. And I think it's just beautiful. I can marry both my passion for education and, you know, being able to give back to my community and my mob. So I think really beautiful thing um, and I'm really looking forward to seeing where that takes me in the future. Thanks Tom, thanks everyone. It's uh, really funny to hear so far we've had two accidental med students <laughs> um, but something I've uh, and you, I'm just touching on something that you said there Tom, something I've learned 
um, from hearing your story and sharing some of your stories over the last few days and then um, looking at some information about you, there's really a commonality in terms of the theme of education and your passion. Each of you has a passion about education and transformation. Um, and I guess, you know, it would be, you know, my mind's like, was that before you came into med school or while you're in med school and because of, which is probably another session and conversation um, to have. But thinking about your journey, and we've, we've heard many, many stories um, about racism, about difficult experiences whilst you're at, at university. Is that something that's impacted you? And um, if so, are you happy to share some ways that help you get through? Um, I can start, I suppose. Um, just a bit of more of a background about me is I grew up all across Australia. I went to seven different primary schools, I think, in the end, and just went from real small communities all the way from Northwest WA, um, Gulf of Carpentaria, um, yeah, North, North, North Queensland, right down to the Southwest. And then I eventually found myself getting a scholarship to go to a private school in Perth. Um, and that's where I sort of first really started to recognize what racism was and I guess have a skill of how to deal with it. And I think that's something that unfortunately a lot of us have to learn. Um, and whether that's a, something that is for ourselves or for better teaching the people around us, um, it, 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 it does take its toll. Um, and I guess for me, you know, I, I look back at it at the time and thought this is just a process of young boys not knowing what they're talking about coming from, you know, these very priv privileged and at least elite, elitist lifestyles. Um, but yeah, I got through my undergrad and then postgrad, you'd start to think as you get a bit older that, you know, you wouldn't see as much racism. Um, and especially during uh, clinical terms and going on placement. But I realized that last year when I was in my rural terms that, yeah, it's still ripe and raw in, in a few of the communities. Um, I just remember this distinct stories of, you know, I'd get out to the communities that are run by the sort of fly in, fly out um, health service. And a lot of the tips that were given to the students was to stay away from community members, don't talk to them. Um, and I was like, yeah, righto. And so, went out for one of the out, um, outreach clinics um, and actually bumped into some family of mine. Um, and then, you know, got chatting to them outside the clinic and whatever. And then the nurse came in and told me to, I'll oh, come in, I'll to get you to help me out with something. And then she sort of told me off for talking to the community members. And I just felt very uncomfortable in that situation. Um, and yeah, she, she didn't recognize that I was indigenous until I said, yeah, look, well, I just want to talk to your family when you see them. Um, <laughs> But yeah, I, that's one example um, of, of a bad case that I had to navigate and I ended up pulling a bit early out of that um, placement just because I felt uncomfortable mm. um, with that staff and did, um, you know, went through the system about putting a formal complaint about it. Um, but it has happened in metropolitan um, setting as well in tertiary hospitals. I remember rocking up for my first day of prac um, for all the doctors and other medical students in the crowd and you can imagine what that feels like, just the nervousness and the butterflies you have. Um, and I was fortunate enough to go with um, my non-Indigenous mate and we were on the same ward. Um, and I remember we rocked up and everyone was there, team was ready for handover. And the consultant came in and said, oh, I was only expecting one student and that was my mate. Who are you? And I said, explained, oh, I must have been, I don't know, left off the list or anything, but I'm Yalala, I'm another medical student here from, from UWA. And I just remember in front of everyone um, in the team, almost like a security guard, you know, bounce up front of the club, check my security passes and everything and double checked who I was. And I don't know, just, it's just a sense of uncomfortableness that happened then, um, but also just to do with other um, ways in which they were dealing with indigenous patients on the ward. Um, so yeah, I guess for me, um, I've learned to cope with those mechanisms by um, accepting and I know I shouldn't need to, but accepting their viewpoints, but trying to get them to understand why it's wrong and have those difficult conversations. Um, I think it was mentioned yesterday in the panel discussion that, yeah, it, it's not really our role. We're there, we're there to learn, we're there to become great doctors for our communities. Mm -hmm. um, but I feel unfortunately that a lot of us students still have to take that on um, 
and it's still a huge issue today. Um, <clears throat> my, I guess mine's more of a theme. Um, I, the biggest struggle for me going through um, tertiary education, even high school coming out of that was, I wasn't seeing anyone above me um, in my area who were black fellas who are Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander doing medicine or doing the higher level tertiary stuff. Um, I felt ostracized because I didn't know who to go to. I, I, I was very scared, um, lonely, I didn't have a community. And I was always yearning for that um, growing up. Um, this community of like academics who are black fellas also or like inspirations almost and role models. And I knew that there was um, organizations out there, um, but it just wasn't tangible to me at that time. It wasn't, um, they weren't coming to us and I didn't feel like I was connected with the wider community. And, and I guess that's been a running theme my whole life going through my education is that whatever I do, um, I want to make it better for the mob that come up after me. Um, the, the young Kyle that I think about back then will be so proud of the work that we're all doing here and the community that we fostered. And I think that's very important if we just acknowledge that strength um, that we actually have that responsibility. And it's, it's tough, but we, like Arnie said before, forget who, but we have that inherent response of duty. Um, and that's so true. Um, and I, I really was, that's why my local university never stops hearing about me because I want to make those structural changes that, that stay and are, are sustainable. So when I'm gone, young Kyle or other young Kyles can come up and feel like they're, they're loved and that they have that community. Well, yeah, racism is rife throughout the New Zealand community and very apparent in medical school. Um, my medical school is based in the South Island. It's predominantly uh, New Zealand European with different multicultural small groups of um, multicultural communities within that. Um, but earlier on, because I'm a final year, I think it was maybe two year my second or my third year, there was the policy at the Muron Society Change Policy, where they were capping Māori students, Pacific students, uh, rural students, and putting a limit to how many uh, students were accepted into our course. Um, as a student at the time, you could get the backlash from your peers, you'd get it from the community. It was on media, it was everywhere. And it was ugly, it was really ugly. You kind of just minimised um, what was going on. You minimise yourself. You, I know colleagues that didn't come into lectures. Uh, they kind of, we talked amongst ourselves. We gathered together. Um, I mean, being with your kin and venting and talking about it was probably the best way um, for us to deal with that. And of course, we had the support, support from our um, associations within the med school. Um, who tried to make a comment uh, that it, they didn't accept this policy um, and that our cohort had to, uh, you know, make a comment, make a stance on where they sat with that. And even in that um, discussion within our cohort group, there was still division. You'd still uh, see your Pakia mates who were two people down um, talking negatively about Māori and your position in this med school. And you wonder why we have imposter syndrome. You wonder why we're so worried about, um, you know, being present on the wards, being present in medical school, expressing who you are. Uh, and that was quite earlier on um, in my med school journey. I think now in my clinical years, I don't think there's a run where I haven't had any, like a microaggression or some form of racism happen to myself or witnessing it or, um, you know, just seeing something that is that uh, ethnicity fueled. Where does that comment come from? Why are they thinking that? Are they targeting me? <laughs> Those are the questions that I'm asking myself or am I overanalyzing this because I'm Māori? Because that's how I see the world. Um, for example, I was uh, doing a placement at uh, Urgent Doctors in Dunedin, and I was on an afternoon shift. You get your own clinic room, so that's cool. Do your own thing. Um, and there was a nurse that w uh, came and knocked on my door and said, oh, I've got your next patient. So the joys of being a student is that you get to pick um, the patients you wish to see, um, mainly the easy ones. <laughs> Um, but this nurse had made a point of saying, oh, I've 
picked your next patient and she'd write my name next to the patient that I'm going to see. And I'm like, oh yeah, kids pie, I'll see that patient. And they came in and they were a Māori family. Uh, they had three generations with them. And I was like, sweet, I'm happy to see this whanau. Um, we finished the consult, they'd left and she'd knocked on the door again saying, oh, I've got your next patient and went around and told all the doctors, oh, Zoe's going to see this person. And I, and they come in and they're a Pacific family and I'm like, Oh, okay, cool. I'm happy with that. Carry up, carry on. And throughout the whole night, I was just seeing coloured people. And I thought, oh, I thought at the end when I was walking home, I was like, what was that all about? I mean, I'm happy about that, but she needs to question <laughs> herself. Like this, that's wrong. Um, but I guess in terms of witnessing uh, racism that happens out in clinical areas, uh, I like to use. Uh, I think it's like, uh, what, what should I call it? Uh, curious questioning. Because um, you're a student, you're, you're not in a position of power if you're working under a house officer, a registrar, a consultant. So when you're seeing things or witnessing things, I like to uh, question, make, uh, just make a comment or a question about whatever racial comment or whatever action that they did. So it'd be like, oh, why did you do that? Like, what, what, what are your thoughts about around that? Um, and usually they get shocked. They're like, oh, um, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't know why I did that. They can't explain why they did the racial thing or they put the Māori patient in the corner or whatever. Um, and, I mean, I'm a little bit more mature, so I have the confidence to say that. Uh, I, I would hate to know how my peers and maybe ELM Four, who are just turning into the coming into the clinical space, how they're dealing with it? Because I know I wouldn't have dealt with it as well as I do now. Um, but I hope as I proceed through this thing called medical thing um, that you're on the treadmill now. You can yeah, keep going. <laughs> um, that perhaps I could I can see it and bring it up. Mm. Um, so other people can see it and start doing it themselves and um, yeah just role modeling pulling up racism because it's shit mm. basically mm. and it's not a safe environment for other people like me. Thanks Zoe. Um, yeah totoko the kōrero um, of Zoe. Um, so a bit of background on my medical school career. I'm at the University of Auckland. I'm a um, soon to be proud graduate of the Māori and Pacific Admission Scheme or MAPAS and so that's a little bit of background. Um, that's our admission pathway for Māori and Pacific students entering into not only medicine um, but also nursing and other clinical and non-clinical pathways at the Faculty of Medicine and Health Sciences in Auckland. Um, and that's an affirmative action program that's been running for a few years now and has been doing amazing mahi. Um, but, um, yep, um, it's still ongoing um, <laughs> racism about MAPAS and why we have these affirmative action programs. Um, throughout my medical career, you're, um, you're constantly being, you're constantly questioning, are you worthy of being there? Because you're just getting so much backlash from your peers and from the media and from people who are just incredibly ignorant about why we need these pathways. Um, but the beauty in having these pathways, not obviously just for the end goal of having more Indigenous doctors, is but you find your tribe. Um, and so I started off, um, if you heard Will Nepia's talk, I started off in Hikatea Te Ora, which was a foundation one year program for Māori Pacific students. Um, that's kind of where, I don't know if this is the right term, if I had my cultural awakening, um, we already we always knew that Māori and Pacific health outcomes were shit in our country, but it's not until you face and you see colonisation and you see the impacts being talked to you that you just have this new drive. Um, so yeah, I think what's gotten me through medical school so far is just having your tribe and having, because people just, you know, you're Māori and, like, and Pacifica and all of our other Indigenous Māori, they just get it. Like you don't have to explain yourself; you just they just get it. Um, so I think that's what's been getting me through is just having my people with me. There's a lot in the unspoken yeah. in that commonality, isn't there, Tessa? Yeah, you just feel safe. Mm. There's so many things you don't need to explain or pardon or you know try not to say those eggshells that you we step on at different times. Tom, do you have yeah. to share? Um, I don't think I have to convince anyone in this room that 
racism exists in our medical sector and pretty much every sector in this country and across the ditch. Um, I think what was really tough for me growing up is similar um, to what some of my colleagues were saying, not seeing people ahead of you that were like you. Um, in primary school and high school, I was the only identifying Indigenous person that I knew of. Um, so it felt very isolating. I think the first time I can remember a racist comment directed at me was, you know, kindergarten. I was almost too young to understand what happened, um, but I knew something was wrong. And I remember, you know, going to the teacher and saying, this happened, I don't think it was right. Um, and they kind of brushed it off and said, oh yeah, I'm sure they didn't mean it. And as a little kid, that really stuck with me. And, you know, it took years to be able to get that confidence to kind of call that out again. Um, but yeah, similar to um, before, you know, coming into medical school or university in general, I felt like I finally found my people, found people who get it, mm. people that had such similar experiences to me through school, feeling very isolated or alone. Um, yeah, and you get to see people at the same stage as you ahead of you that are really, you know, fighting for you and in your corner. Um, people in this room, so like Anu Yala when I was in first year, and he was definitely someone I looked up to. Uh, before that, I didn't know any, you know, people that were on the pathway to be mm. an Indigenous doctor, let alone um, an Indigenous doctor. Um, Lilon Bandler also um, was the person that interviewed me or one of the two people that interviewed me to get into medical school. Um, and even just throughout undergraduate, um, you know, she would always give me an email, grab a coffee, get a bit of brekkie, you know, and having someone in your corner really fighting for you is, you know, super important. Also, Maisha, um, you know, <laughs> one of the um, Indigenous medical students near above me, he's just graduated or about to graduate. Um, you know, those people that are ahead of you and, you know, give you those tips and tricks and say, you know, um, you know, have a yarn, have a chat, like this is how we can support you. This is, you know, what you need to be prepared for. Um, but I also want to note that um, similar to what Dr. Alicia was saying yesterday, you know, cultural load is, is intense. You know, we can't all, um, you know, be the only people that uh, have that responsibility to look after mob. And there's definitely some non-Indigenous people in my life as well that um, are safe to go to and to rely on. Um, yeah. Mm, again, Tom, finding those people, um, be it of the same, you know, ethnicity, cultural identity as you or not, but finding finding those people. So just, you know, thank you for sharing that generosity. You know, I'd like to think that we could get to a stage, um, particularly when we're talking about medicine and health and healthcare and wellbeing, that we get to a place and a space for all of us where we, we don't have to carry that. We don't have to be generous in terms of, you know, offering that, um, uh, thinking about those processes that we use to, to survive. Um, let's think about one thing that we can share with the room. So looking out there, each, uh, many of these people are going to be your colleagues. And I invite everyone out there to think of these young individuals as your future colleagues. Yes, there's a power uh, a dynamic at play at the moment, they're students, but they'll one, bit, one day be your colleagues. And if there was something that you could say to them, something that you would want them to know, be they the educators at university or your colleagues on the floor, is there something you'd like to offer? Um, yeah, just, I guess, touching on Tom's point about the mentoring and how important it is to have that informal connection with people um, and probably looking up to me and looking at the things, not what not to do was probably the case for you. But um, it was, it was a... Um, it, There's a story there, or a few. There, there... There's just so much power in that and just like every, most people have mentioned today, it's just hard to find people who have gone and done it before you, um, especially, you know, we, we come from such different backgrounds and different places across the world. Um, it's, it's just something that I really valued about doing my rural terms is going out and working with junior doctors um, who are working in that space. Um, and seeing them and being part of the, their team um, was definitely a motivator for me. Um, I'm currently on my gap year uh, doing a bit of work, but um, yeah, I just 
remember thinking this whole whole year about those memories and thinking like this is what really motivates me and pushes me along seeing that if others can do it before me then why can't I do it myself um so yeah I just guess touching on yesterday's point is how can we better support um, these 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 mentoring processes um and how can we better structure them um from a university point of view um I just love to also connect with other indigenous students from across, you know, across across the other side of town, across the other state, across the other side of the country. Um, I think it's just, it's just a lot of value in being able to come together and share each other's stories. Thanks, Ian. Thanks. I think I'd want my colleagues in the future to know that we just need to love each other. Um, it's a it's a hard yard doing this reconciliation, all that re-indigenizing and decolonization stuff, and we all know that in the room here. Um, I think we just need to be kind to one another. And again, what one of our colleagues said earlier today, um, knowing that we all have our own emotional, we're human beings, we have, all have our own stories and, and things that we are passionate about. I just feel like um, if we're going to make this change happen, we need to work together and not come with defense or not come with um, you know, like a, an ego when we come to the discussion table together with Aboriginal, Torres Strait Islander, Maori and then non-Indigenous people as well, that we're all in this together. And I think that most of my meaningful work has been with non-Indigenous mob who have actually been proper allies and they've actually taken up the, their labour and, and just wanted advice and just wanted consultation on things and they've actually done the hard yards and that's how, that's what allyship is and that's the love right there and that's, that's the alleviation of that labour from us as blackfellas because um, we all have knowledges to share, all of us here and in the room here and it's just that when we start speaking about it, those things can be risen up again and it hurts us sometimes and I feel like we need to come together in that third cultural space as um, Uncle Wayne Williams here goes on about with our cultural safety training from UQ. And I totally agree with that, that third cultural space where we realise what do we actually agree on together instead of what don't we agree on. Um, that's where the conversation I think is, can move forward. So that's what I want my colleagues in the future to know. Okay, you're good. Oh, mine is definitely still to uh, call, out, call out racism when you see it. Um, it's only it's going to be the only way that people are going to learn that they I, that they may need to do some self reflection around that. You can do it in a kind way. You can do it in a uh, curious, questioning way. Um, that's what I'd hope my colleagues would be able to do for me. And there were situations where I wish that happened. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Um, I think in terms of. I don't know, not advice, but um, just making yourself visible as um, Māori doctors and professionals and knowing that we're not alone and we're there. Um, obviously, there's a place for hierarchy in medicine, like you don't want a junior doctor making consultant-level decisions, but um, in an in informal whakapanangatanga or connection-building level, um, I think it's important that we're... Um, that we build those connections um, laterally instead of like a in a hierarchical sense, and then um, it's a bit of thing in medicine, so I can talk to doctors and talk to consult Māori, Māori doctors um, and just feel that sense of connection and, you know, they're not scary. They're there, they're there, to, they're there to help us, um, and it's just about them making themselves visible to us and just realising we're all in it for the same goal, I think. Thanks, yeah. Tessa. Everyone stole my voice. Um, <laughs> it's hard going last, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. I think my advice, um, you know, for our First Nations people is, you know, look after yourself first and foremost. If you have the capacity, um, be there for your colleagues to rely on. Um, give that support, that advice. Um, for our um, non-Indigenous colleagues, I think what I would really love to see, well, in a sec, um, what I would really like to see is our non-Indigenous colleagues not only caring when we're in the room, um, mm -hmm. something that was really eye-opening for me was one of the tutors I had um, was delivering, you know, a, a class, didn't know I was in the room, didn't know that I was Indigenous, but the way that she taught and spoke about Indigenous people with such care and compassion mm -hmm. and just a genuine ally was such a relief for me. I felt so safe and comfortable in that space. And I spoke to her after the class and she's still one of, uh, I'd call her a mentor um, still to this day. Um, you know, it's not only calling, like, you know, thinking about that when we're in the room. If you're teaching, you know, a group of interns, um, you know, on their first week and 
you know, there's, you know, you don't think there's an Indigenous person in that room, still having that care and compassion, not making casual racist jokes, um, you know, just being a compassionate human being, it's really not that hard. But it's, yeah, just being that, being aware and not only changing your behaviour when you think you're going to get called out on it as well. Mm. It, it seems so simple, doesn't it? But, um, you know, we, we need to have homework as to why, why, if it's so simple, why are we not doing it? Um, I, I think the future's in amazing, amazing hands with these young individuals. And I think uh, with all of you, or with my university, we have an Indigenous entry stream. And it, it's amazing to have that pathway uh, you know, for my countrymen and women to come through. I, I do think in some aspect, though, there is a deficit focus for that as well um, as to, you know, why that is there and why that's created. And, and I, I do know that's another conversation. If anyone's got any other ideas of a different way to do it, then, you know, hit, hit me up. But um, what I'm feeling from talking with all of you is our medical schools are privileged to have you. It's not that you're privileged to be there, which is often the focus of the IES or the Indigenous Entry Stream. Just to have students with the, the grounding, the generosity, um, the tenacity, you know, to find your place accidentally in medical school, to be first in family um, or to, to be somewhere where you haven't seen someone stand before is really amazing and the courage that that, um, that shows. So I'm actually really glad that everyone's been able to see you because I think in ourselves we often aren't as kind or as we don't have the clarity of ourselves in terms of seeing who we are, but it's only through the eyes of others. And from what I've seen from speaking with each of you and listening to some of your presentations and... Um, and having a good laugh with you is that I've been able to see you and you're asking everyone else, your colleagues, to see you and um, to allow you to be present to take that space up. So thank you. Do we have time for questions or five minutes for questions? <clears throat> so we've got a roving mic going around. We've got one over here. Thank you. Oh, two hands. <laughs> Whole table. My colleagues. Back with the men, I see. Um, I guess I just want to know, you tell us what's the whānau or mob interaction you've had that you're most proud of? What's the question, sorry? Did you hear that? It does a bit louder. What, did, what, what like, patient or, or whānau or mob interaction you've had in the in the hospital or community that you're most proud of? I've got one on the top of my head. Um, I went to East Arnhem Land earlier this year um, at, with the Ada Australian Indigenous Doctors Association and the Northern Territory Primary Health Network. Um, they sent 17 of us up on the SRC and one of my biggest things there was um, it wasn't the clinical ward stuff, wasn't the interactions in the clinic. Um, that was probably below the expectation I wanted to be in community and go up there and, and actually see the mob up there. And I remember going to Galawinku Island, which is um, white fellas call it Elko Island, and went to Galawinku and they had a, um, a school carnival on there and they had a women's shelter as well and they did domestic violence clinics and all that sort of stuff. And so the women, women's business went and did women's business and we all left to do the, the sports carnival. And I really valued that because when I was there, we got to be surrounded and, and immersed in this mob up there, the Yongi people and how strong their culture is. And I felt almost inspired. I was up there teaching them preventative healthcare stuff like smoking cessation and how it could affect your lungs. And, and you know, just all that basic um, preventative health things that kids need to hear about. And there was a barrier because they only spoke Yongu and I don't speak Yongu, I'm Balanda according to them, which is out, this is an outsider. And so I, was struggling to communicate a lot of the time and the, the little fellas and the little judges would laugh at me, you know, good ways, um, laugh at me because I couldn't speak Yongu. Mm -hmm. And um, so one of the smallest children is only like this tall, I think it's like three or four or something, he comes up and he notices me struggling, talking about atherosclerosis and smoking and all that sort of stuff. And I was like, how am I going to translate that? Um, but he come up to me and, and he sat down with me for about an hour and taught me language 
and then I went back out there and, and used that language and he brought all his friends over so like almost like I was a performance for him. <laughs> like I sort of that language. Um, so I did it for them all and they all um, had good laughs and they, they really understood what I was saying and got some good photos with them. So yeah, that's the sort of like, the sort of touch that I want to have with community. I don't want that sort of cynical clinical perspective. I really value those sort of interactions. That's mine. <laughs> wow. Be, when people ask you that kind of stuff, just be really gentle about patient confidentiality and your kind of and your patient right to privacy. So think really carefully. And if you don't think that you can formulate a safe answer, you don't have to answer. Thank you. Do you guys want to give any more examples? Um, just touching on mine, I think being able to work on language programs and just what Carl's talking about now, um, huge issue is the communication and cultural barriers to access of healthcare. Um, and for me, that was outside of my medical curriculum work and it really was through mentorship and my boss, Professor Gareth Bainham, who's a geneticist in Perth, has gone above and beyond to um, assist me with this. And I think it's those sort of, um, you know, interactions um, where, where non-Indigenous people really put us at the forefront um, in terms of driving change. Um, that, that, that's really quite amazing. Um, but just another short example was um, last year I was on, um, on break, so I decided to drive home for the weekend. Um, and turns out whilst it was there, it was um, the, um, it, there was the vaccination rollout during COVID. So they were trying to encourage more community members um, to get the vaccinations. And during this time while I was up there, I was just able to work over a weekend um, with the Royal Flying Doctor Service um, and be able to, by the end of the weekend, have everyone vaccinated. Um, and that was just purely through communication. So it just further you know, empowered me to go back and do what I'm continuing to do um, on the side of studying. Thank you. Do we have another question? There was one more here. Sounds like Yalaloo was, you know, benefit to the community for you being in the right place at the right time. And it's similar with you, Carl, with having that young fella recognise that he could teach you something. So, yeah. Kia ora tēnā koutou i o kōrero. Thank you for sharing your insights. I think um, sometimes the further we get away from medical school, the less sort of forward in the very front of our prefrontal cortex as these experiences are. So thanks for reminding us about a lot of the stuff that I think most of us have experienced or even do continue to experience. Um, you touched a lot about the difficulties that you have, particularly with institutional racism in the clinical space, and you gave us some, some real thought-provoking reflections for us as, as doctors to sort of think about how we can support you better. But I know that, that a lot of the institutional racism also happens before you get onto the floor, and I'm just wondering if you had any sort of feedback or, or what, what would you like um, from people who are sort of in the more um, sort of academic institution space to be able to do to affect change so that the difficulties you've, you've articulated um, through sort of pre-clinical time um, could be made easier for you. Does anyone want to take that? So talking about at university and, and uh, in the learning spaces. I could probably make a comment about that. Um, so as I alluded to, I did the uh, health science first year. So that's the foundational year for uh, basic science for all, uh, all, all people going into professional programs for Otago. So that's physio, diet dietetics, uh, medicine, dentistry. Um, so for me, we don't get taught about haora Māori or any of those concepts until we're already in medicine, maybe two or three, year, year two or three, we're really going through the, those concepts. So really, I think that's when we should be talking or teaching about cultural safety, uh, cultural competence, haora Māori, right at day dot. Mm -hmm. So there's an expectation that they should already know about this or learn about this before they even branch out into the professions that they wish to go to. Um, I mean, I did a whole lot of Māori paper because I wanted good grades and I already knew the topic really well. So, I, But I think um, there's other people out there who, who need it a little bit more than I do. And I think that if we take 
a, a stance from the very beginning that you need to be culturally uh, competent before you even come here until you're welcome into this tertiary space and maybe we won't have to fight the battles that we do every day. Yeah, I think it's tricky. Um, I think in medical school specifically, you know, a lot of the Indigenous content that we get um, feels like it's sort of tacked on at the end. I think a few other presenters have spoken about this, how we need to figure out how to integrate this into our everyday um, learning and teaching. Um, you know, there's all these modules that we do and because they're online based, you, you know, people just skip through it. They don't actually engage with the content. So they get it checked off at the end and, you know, they're culturally competent, but there's no way of actually, you know, determining if that's, you know, true or not. Um, yeah, I think in terms of how do we fix that, I don't know. I think it's a big collaborative effort that needs to happen. Things like this definitely, you know, pointing everyone in the right direction. Um, but I think Indigenous um, curriculums need to be, you know, embedded into our learning from day dot, not, you know, chucked on a Friday afternoon when everyone's tired and wants to go home. Um, and very, it has to be meaningful and it has to be um, led by Indigenous people as well. Yeah, I, I, t I totally agree with you, Tom. It needs to be the, a horizontal approach throughout the whole medical training and um, not the vertical approach, meaning that one-off lecture or that one-off assessment piece, it needs to be integrated where people cannot escape it because that's the only way we're going to become more competent in that space, I think. I really, um, I really loved your question because also adding to what um, Carl and Thomas and Zoe have shared already is that uh, something that some of my children would say, not to me, but about issues is that's an issue, not an issue me. And I, what, what we need to think, <laughs> well, what we need to think is we need to remove um, the space. Uh, yes, everyone's got lived experience and expertise within their experiences and their life and the way that they've journeyed through life. But we need to remove the burden of the students becoming the teachers in the space. Um, and I was sharing a story earlier on uh, with someone today that, you know, I've been a registered nurse for 27 years, critical care areas, you know, and I've come in through the side door, the back door to academia. And so with all of that comes, you know, imposter syndrome and, and, and everything. But it took me a little while to walk up and down the corridor of my building, um, one of the universities I worked at, and I saw PhD, 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 PhD. I don't have a PhD, but it didn't take me long from recognising that those colleagues of mine, they have qualifications and they have education, but they don't have knowledge. And I think to help assist this from um, the top-down approach as, as opposed to the, the grassroots up approach that is currently happening is it's for our educators to be educated. Um, you know, they haven't had the benefit of coming through university when you have or when standards have changed or um, altered so that there is pedagogy, uh, pedagogical approaches and, um, and insight and, and the ability to see us as Indigenous sovereign First Peoples. I know I'm not on the panel, but yeah. <laughs> well, thank you very much uh, for listening. But one more question. Um, the theme this year obviously is decolonising the education system and like all of the tropics and everything. How do you think that the schools can help support it going on a cultural journey? That's what we like to call it. So can taking the medical schools on a cultural journey as well as other uh, the non-Indigenous students and just maybe some Indigenous students that don't have the same cultural um, experience, not by their own means, how can you best, how can they best support you going through the medical while they're decolonising, um, support students that are very strong in their culture, the ones that are probably, you know, caught upon during lectures, to give their opinions, et cetera. How do you think that the schools and our Aboriginal health teams are 
trying to navigate the decolonization space still make you feel safe as a student? Um, I'll start and just two points to that is the first is I think in a lot of ways you're taught to be culturally competent, especially for non-Indigenous people that go through medical school. But, you know, it's, it's never a, a discussion about competency because I don't think anyone can be fully competent um, in, in the culture. So I like to use the word like responsiveness and being able to, you know, reflect in the different environments that they'll be working in. But just one thing linking in and tying it back to that discussion about racism is that, you know, we're all taught that racism is bad and to be a good ally. But I think in many ways, a lot of my non-Indigenous peers lack the ability to process what to do if they do see racism. And especially as students, we often have that power dynamics where you work with consultants or people in often high positions. Um, I think for a lot of them, you know, they want to say something, but they just don't know how. So that's something I'd love to see implemented across medical schools. Um, and just the second thing about um, just personally for me, um, it was quite hard for me to, uh, you know, go away from community. Um, and I feel as if sometimes there's a lack of understanding about the sacrifices that a lot of us have to make in order to chase a seven, six year long degree. Um, and for me personally, um, it was spending time away from family members. Um, you know, since I started my journey, I've had to go back for four or five funerals for uncles, grandmothers, aunties. Um, and it's just that build up of grief you have and you think always at the back of your head, like, is this worth it? Am mm -hmm. I doing the right thing? Um, and like, you know, when I finally get through, am I gonna look back and say, yes, yes, I'm glad I went and did it. And so I found that quite hard to do that. I found it very hard to pause my cultural learning. So we're quite fortunate that we still have quite strong law and culture back at home. Um, and, you know, I feel as if I'm a poster syndrome when I come to medical school down in Perth, but also imposter in my community sometimes because I'm just so far behind with all my cultural loads. So yeah, I just feel as if that sense of understanding is still, um, is still not quite there from, from, from a lot of faculties and education systems that I've been involved in. Mm. Well, I hope all of you have um, enjoyed our yarn today and perhaps um, have something from any of these deadly young fellas to take take on board and, and to think about. Today, we've been yarning with Yalalu, Kyle, Zoe, Tessa and Tom. Please join me in a round of applause for them. Good job, man. Good job, boy.